Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. We are opening now this panel discussion inside the new, new Theatre Helsinki Festival here at uh, Lucan. We have today a very uh, rich panel, a uh, very ambitious um, uh, program. There are many things that we would like to, to discuss uh, here today. And we are also very pleased that we have audience here present with us. We also have two guests that they are online from Germany. And then we have some people following us from uh, YouTube. Well, thanks everybody for being here. So it's a panel discussion that lasts two hours. But since it's quite packed, uh, we'll immediately give the, the voice to the guests that are here. And I will also present myself. <laughs> My name is Davide Giovanzana. I am one uh, of the founder of New Theater Helsinki with David Cosma and kind of uh, creating this whole event and uh, with the help of Yasmin and Nori, we are developing the activities of New Theatre Helsinki, and, but you will hear more from them later. But let's start uh, maybe with you. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's actually really nice to be here. My name is Nori Varga and I am a facilitator and coordinator of the New Theatre Helsinki Theatre of the Future Youth Project. So I'm mainly working with youth, but of course I'm also involved in two different uh, projects within the organization. And uh, by education, I'm a theater pedagogue and uh, a theater historian. Yasmin. Hi, uh, nice to see everybody. I'm Yasmin Ahsanola and I'm a freelance actor and performer. I trained in England, in London, and then I worked in London before I moved back just before the pandemic. And uh, yes, so I work with the New Theatre Helsinki project in the youth project, and then I'm also a board member of the House of New Theatre board. And yes, and I am working with diversity and equality with the Actors Union, so I'm currently the president of the Actors Union e Actors Union's Equality. Uh, committee. So, yes, I'm here to talk about that. Thank you. And then Anna. Uh, hello, everyone. Very, very nice to be here. I'm Anna Danchep, and I bring some words from the music scene uh, to this panel. Uh, I'm a singer myself, singer, songwriter, and an artist. Um, I worked a couple of decades in different roles in Finnish music scene, and, and these diversity and equality questions are very important to me as well since I'm Finnish-Bulgarian and represent Bulgarian heritage in Finland as well. So thank you for having me. Thanks. And then Vanya. Hello, my name is Vanya Hamidi Saxon. I'm a Swedish Finn living in Sweden, but coming to Finland a lot and uh, digging into my f uh, Finnish family history and working with multilingual uh, performances and dramatic works. I'm a playwright, so I write um, and uh, are just, uh, I just finished my PhD, so I had my public defense in December at UniArt Stockholm. And the thesis uh, is called uh, The Potential of Multilingualism in Dramatic Works. So it's about a playwright's perspective on multilingualism, but it touches upon of course, actors and the audience perspective as well. Very happy to be here. And then finally, Rogerio. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me also. Um, I'm originally from Portugal. I have been living in Finland since 2016. I'm an independent artist, theater director, sometimes also playwright. I'm a performer and I'm also an educator. And I'm planning to talk a little bit about all these things together related to the topic of this uh, panel discussion. So thank you once again for having me. Thank you. I would like also to mention that Vanya was leading a workshop during the festival on multilingualism, and Rogerio also performed this week in the festival. 
and uh, also Yasmin and uh, Nori presented the work of the youth theater also during the festival. The plan for today for this panel is to uh, tackle several questions. The first one, New Theatre Helsinki is advocating for having a space here uh, in Finland, here in Helsinki, about diversity and inclusiveness. And we would like then to start the panel discussion with the interview of two representatives, one of Gorky Theatre and one of Oyun Space, where, uh, so there are existing uh, spaces in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, and we would like to listen about their experience, how it was, the challenges that they faced in establishing these spaces, and also about the new dramaturgies that they are trying to present. Then we will shift to the question of multilinguism. Is language as a barrier? Uh, here in Finland, it's very strong, the, the idea that theater is a place of language and that theater has to defend Finnish or Swedish, then we would like to tackle this notion of multilinguism. The, the next topic that we will discuss today, it's about um, representation of diversity. So there has been a survey among actors and also in the music field. And Yasmin and Anna will talk about this survey and the issue of structural discrimination. And then we will end up this panel with uh, the experience of Nori with the youth theater, uh, how it's going, the difficulties, challenges, and also what they are doing. But let's start with our German guests. I will move. Uh, hello, hello, Ivo and Launa. I will start hello. maybe first with Ivo. Um, Ivo Dreger from Gorky Theater. Would you like just to present yourself briefly before we start the interview? Yeah, of course. Hi, I'm Ivo. Uh, I work in Maxim Gorky Theatre here in Berlin. Uh, unfortunately, I have to send you cold greetings. It's freezing, but you're from Finland, so you don't care about our like minus five <laughs> degrees. Um, yes, so uh, I work in the dramaturgy department. I'm a dramaturgy assistant in the office um, of Maxim Gorky Theatre, and I've been working there for one and a half years now. I studied literature and dramaturgy before here in Germany, and um, yes, my focus is very much on the different productions we do in Gorky and also very many festivals that we present. Thank you. I, um, I've seen some productions of Gorky Theater. I especially liked a lot how Gorky Theater, you reconsider some German classics like Schiller, also a new production like Rabat. Uh, Rabat, which if I'm not, not mistaken in German means discount. So um, could you tell us a little bit about why to reconsider these classics or what do you want to achieve by rewriting these classics? What kind of narratives you aim to, to display on the stage? I think uh, for that aspect, it's very much important to keep in mind that German theater, the German theater scene, the mainstream scene is still very much, very white, very cis, very hetero uh, oriented and portrayed on stage, but actually that's not the picture we see when we walk on the street in Germany. That's not at all what I look out of the window every day and see. So re reconsidering classics in the sense that Gorky does it, it's all about um, actually portraying the real life experience and not having some kind of uh, white utopia. <laughs> it's not a utopia. <laughs> but uh, portrayed on stage, which is not and has not and never been the case, but in fact um, cancels out people from the public view that still have been, have existed and have been there all along. So by reconsidering the classics and actually um, focusing on portray uh, having them portrayed by actors with 
um, a migrant background or having them uh, portrayed by actors that are part of our exile ensemble who came from Syria, came from Egypt, came from Palestine. Uh, Palestine. Um, we put the people on the stage into those classic stories that everybody thinks are very white, um, that live Berlin today and make, make the population of Germany up. And um, what kind of challenges did you face like when Gorky Theater uh, has this change of direction and you really became this space where these new narratives uh, were presented? What kind of challenges you faced and uh, how it has been since? I mean, I've been only there for one and a half years, but I'm hearing a lot about the challenges that we face and still face. Um, so, Shamin Langhoff, when I talk about the Gorky Theatre and if, and we're talking about the diversity that Gorky brought to the German theatre scene, uh, it's very much due to Shamin Langhoff, who is our current head of theatre. Um, and she started in 2013-14, uh, so it's already been almost 10 years uh, that she has been the head of Gorky Theatre. Um, so the first challenge is right at the beginning. Gorky is one of the state theatres here in Berlin, but we're the one with the least funding from the state. So we're the smallest <laughs> of all of them. Uh, we don't get as much money as the biggest stages. Um, and from the get-go, when Shamin started, uh, she started with a colleague, Jens Hilje, who is a gay man, and then it was, okay, Gorky is becoming the gay and the migrant theater. That's the, like, that's what you are now, so that's your narrative and your kind of niche corner, so, um, yeah, that's where you belong. And uh, the challenges were very much on this structural level um, in terms of funding, in terms of space, in terms, but also in terms of press. And in um, we had uh, Nazis coming to the theater and th uh, threatening um, the productions, threatening the audience. Um, we still, to this day, and it's been almost 10 years, we get press reviews of plays where it's like, okay, I mean, I couldn't get anything out of the play, but the migrants around me were crying, so it must mean something to them. So it's like, the, still it's this migrant theater lens that everybody puts on us. Um, and to always come back and be like, yeah, but no, we didn't only cast this actress because uh, they fit to the Gorky in terms of they are, have a Turkish background, but they're actually a good actress. Or um, to we, we're not only telling this story because we have a migrant family in it, but we're telling the story because it's a human issue and it means something to us on a human level. So constantly uh, emphasizing the importance of the work we do and the importance of the stories we're telling and connecting that to the German mainstream audience which for now we are lucky that we've built up our own German mainstream audience, <laughs> which just goes to Gorky because that's where their stories have been told um, for 10 years. But the other people that go to opera or wherever else, uh, they still should connect to Gorky. And that's, yeah, it's, that is an ongoing struggle. That, um, what you mentioned about the segregation uh, element, because this is a, an aspect that touches us a lot. Like, are we creating with New Theatre Helsinki a new form of segregation uh, just for the, let's say, immigrant or communities living in Finland but not represented on the institutional stage? But what we would like to build is a bridge, a, a bridge between the, let's say, uh, Finnish professionals and the immigrant artist. Do you feel that, uh, were you able, or are you able to establish this bridge? And how, if yes, how you, you, you could establish that? Mm -hmm. um, yes, 
I think we are getting closer and closer to having a maybe somewhat stable bridge. <laughs> I, I think if uh, some people, if one community has had a space in the public eye for decades, for centuries, and one has not had a space at all, you need to give a community a space first and then make a bridge, because if you make a bridge to nothing, then what are you making a bridge to? Um, but I think in terms of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's two things, I'd say. Uh, one thing is structural and one thing is considering the content in terms of building bridges. The content thing is very much about, we're telling stories that German people who went to German schools know, like the classic retellings, but we're also telling new stories that people in Germany know because they don't live in a bubble, they live in a city where they experience things, where they see other people, where they meet other people. And to kind of connect on a, yeah, on a human issue level within these stories, um, because we're not only focusing on migrant issues, we're focusing on issues of any marginalized group. That means racism, that means classism, that means uh, sexism, that means, um, yeah, celebrating queerness in all aspects uh, and putting that on the map. Um, so that aspect, I think, is building bridges and is building bridges also between especially those marginalized communities. And if they have built bridges, then they can build a stronger bridge to whoever is not part of any of those marginalized uh, groups, which is, in fact, not that many. I mean, it's essentially, it's uh, rich German white old men, probably. <laughs> That's, and like everybody else is part of some kind of marginalized group in a way. So if you connect to one and you connect to another, then it becomes a stronger bridge. So and in a structural sense, I think uh, it's ha it has helped us that uh, we're doing a lot of a lot of lobbying. It's a lot of politics. It's a lot of um, always going to the people who have the money, applying for extra funding, uh, picking up, picking a fight sometimes and saying like, okay, but you have to fund us. Also sometimes pressuring that point of, um, honestly, of uh, not like you're forgetting the marginalized people. You have to do like some social work for marginalized people to so give us money and then we do nice work, good work with it. But that's uh, like taking a lot of means to to get as much money as possible to fund those stories and to f share the resources with the other marginalized groups and uh, taking up that work. So it's a lot of networking <laughs> and it's a lot of collaborating and, and bridging out. And I think in that way, we got positive reviews. We got more people into the theater. Uh, Maxim Gorky Theater was, uh, pronounced theater of the year for uh, 2014 and 2016. Shamin Langhoff has won multiple prizes uh, for her work. And this fact that we were always the political theater as well. We always did go uh, to the streets. We went to demonstrations. We raised our voice in uh, for the things that we think are right and that align with the view and the work of Gorky. Uh, the Maxim Gorky Theatre, not Gorky the person necessarily. Um, and that fact, of course, raises um, hate from the ones that are against what we do in Gorky, but also gets the work that we do a much larger audience and much, much more publicity. And that's kind of also a very huge factor <laughs> in getting more money and building bridges and having more resources. Well, now you have been touching several points that I, I, I would like to uh, bounce. I don't know if we have the time, but you were talking about lobbying because we are also, this is an activity that is not so much visible in New Theater Helsinki, but we are doing a lot of lobbying, talking with the politicians, uh, representative of city of Helsinki, 
who on the one hand, they acknowledge, yes, absolutely, Helsinki is absolutely diverse now, and there is a lack, but at the same time, uh, they don't, they are not ready to commit, uh, because it's money, and um, they are not ready to take this, let's say, risk. So this is a big uh, question also for us, and to be interesting. There is also the question of um, the, the spectators, uh, how to reach uh, the new spectators, and how do, does it work? Because I, I do believe, and I think this is a, also an issue here in Finland, that the question of diversity is not just a question of poor immigrants trying to find a space to, to work, but it's also a generational issue. Like the, the young generations are asking for diversity. They are uh, exposed to diversity through social media uh, on a daily basis. So um, there is a demand. And at the moment, the institutional theater doesn't really respond to this demand, at least here in Finland. So. Uh, I would be more inter very interested, like in this, during these 10 years, how was the audience development? How you reach the audience? Did you also, because a question that we are asking us is, do we sh should we also reconsider how we make theater? Is maybe the way we think that how theater should be very normative? And should we also reconsider that maybe some communities don't come to the theater not only because their stories are not represented, but also because the way the stories are told are, do, do, do not touch them. So did, also, did you notice also a change of how you do theater, how you consider dramaturgy? In some aspects, yes, and in other aspects, not very much. <laughs> I think, uh, so in the premise for Shamin's work at Gorky, uh, you know, any any head of theatre gets um, applies for the job and says, okay, we want to do uh, this is what we want to accomplish, and that's how we want to do it. And for uh, and then the state says, okay, you get the job, but you have to do repertoire theatre, or you have to reach the villages outside of the city, or something like that. And for her, the um, the state premise is that she does not only do repertoire, repertoire theatre, so the classic theatre we put on stage and is like the classic while well, my play or even, um, yeah. Uh, but she also has a premise for um, doing other events, doing performances, doing concerts, doing panels, doing um, like interactive uh, theatre, doing exhibitions with art, films, all of that. So that's a huge pile of things, which is not a classic theater in the way that we are used to having it put on stage, but is different, is any, anything else <laughs> that is to do with culture. And that's part of her job at, in running Gorky. And I think that's also what helped Gorky gain new audiences because, um, I think some t some audience members, definitely, we got through, uh, okay, what's the story we're telling on stage? Or um, they saw um, a performance piece first, and then they thought, okay, I like this actor, and I'm going to see what the new production they're in. And then they kind of got into it. Uh, we actually right now have an actress in our ensemble who, as a student, as a student in school still she came to she had to go and see a play at Gorky and it was Verrücktes Blut which you've also uh, seen the Schiller one the classic one and for her there was very much like okay they're telling my story I did not care about theater at all before but now I'm going to study to become an actress and now she's actually working at Gorky <laughs> sometimes uh, that's how you reach people sometimes it's um it's through through very weird ways. We've also done, um, and we're still doing the festivals. Um, so right now we're working on a festival that has to do with the Gezi Park protests in Istanbul, which happened 10 years ago. Uh, we're gonna have that in May and June. 
Um, and that's also going to be including a bunch of different formats of events. So I think, I think in this, for me, that's also what makes Gorky. Sometimes you just started going there because there was a nice party format that was happening, and then you ended up going into the theater. That's also a way to do things. Um, Ivo, thanks a lot. I'm looking at the time. Uh, yes. I, I have to stop here, although this is a really stimulating, and I wish we could continue, but maybe uh, also the audience might have questions for you. I uh, will leave this for the discussion at, at the end. Uh, thanks again, uh, Ivo. And I will uh, switch to Lona. Are you with us, Lona? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Ah, th yes, now we can see you also. Okay, sweet. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Hello, Lona. Um, we are very happy that you are here. You represent, you are the director of the space Oyun. So it's a relatively new space. It's not so much established as Gorky Theater, which let's say it is an institutional theater and 10 years ago changed completely the, the direction. But Oyun is a completely new space. And maybe uh, we, before we start the interview, it could be nice that if you open up a little bit uh, Oyun space, what do you do there? How you managed to create this space? What was the, the, the trajectory to finally get the space? And um, what are your, uh, let's say, objective or uh, wishes for this, with this space that you managed to establish? Yeah, thank you. Again, thank you for the invite, <laughs> um, invitation. So basically, um, Oyun might be new, it was born in 2020, but the concept goes back to um, 2016. We had a different space before that, which was more community-based and uh, but a lot smaller, actually. Um, well, you was born out of like a urgency um, to rethink and to redesign and reconsider who spaces are made for. You know, you um, is a physical space, 4,000 square meter in a former brewery. It's quite large. Um, in Neukölln, right off uh, Hermannplatz, and we um, we aim to be the anti-disciplinary anti space that's rather centering decolonial, queer feminist, class critical, and uh, neurodiverse perspectives. And the way we go about it is that we center not only the perspectives but the bodies that are affected by margin, or that are members of marginalized communities and affected by um, different intersectional kind of forms of discrimination. Um, so I think that's that's the core. We opened um, on the first day of the first lockdown in March 2020 and have managed to, to grow quite, I would say, um, fast in a way where we, like when we talk about numbers, we start with nine people, now we're 30. You know, we started with um, 30,000 additional funding now, like or last year was 600,000, this year is gonna be a lot less again. Um, and um, we're, we only receive project funding, and I wanna say it's one of the very few spaces that do so. Um, the space is, in, in square meter may be a bit larger than Gorky, but we receive 17 times less funding than Gorky. Obviously, it's a different setting. It's state owned. Uh, it's a it's a state run and own um, theater with an ensemble. This is a luxury that we don't have. Um, so there there are challenges and struggles that come with it um, because we are a rather collective led or spirited or inspired organization. Um, there are sometimes clashes with people that don't want to see us in these spaces. Um, similar to what Ivo has mentioned, there's um, quite a lot of an increasing attacks by far right, by Nazis, by right wing. Um, many people from um, the outskirts of Berlin, but also Neukölln in the direct neighborhood um, 
And then, of course, there are people in power that don't find it as relevant um, as we do and as a lot of people like yourself included do, um, to kind of bring diversity, representation, inclusion into the arts and culture. Um, and, and these people happen to be in position of power, which would be, for example, politicians and funders. Um, and that, I would say, is one of the main main challenges to survive as a space, um, despite kind of the backlash of, of far-right, powerful decision, decision makers, I would say. That will be very interesting to dig more on the hostility. Um, but also, what kind of support you encountered and how you managed to create the space? I mean, like I mentioned, it's, um, it, I, I often say the best ideas are born out of personal interest and out of personal needs. And it's been a personal need considering um, the increasing attacks on trans, queer, black and brown bodies in Berlin to have a safe space or to have a space where people can navigate without having um, to be constantly under um, attack. You know, um, so this is how the space kind of came about. It was out of a need for a space where we can feel safe, where we can um, exist and coexist and collaborate within like intersectional kind of um, marginalized communities. Where we we started obviously during COVID, um, but it it grew to different communities, and so. Um, they were constantly kind of growing and intersecting. Sorry, I, I, I think I lost my train of thoughts. What was the question? <laughs> How you managed to create the space? Uh, because we are yeah. facing a similar situation where everybody acknowledged, yes, yes, uh, Helsinki has changed. Yes, yes, there is a, a need. But mm -hmm. no, we don't want to give you a space. No, we don't give, mm -hmm. want to give you. We don't trust you somehow. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that, and then, yeah. Do, like, are you asking in, uh, like, practically how yeah. we managed to... Yes, yes. Um, I think 10 years ago, this would have been absolutely impossible for us to, to take over a space. Um, that was also due to, I want to say, the acknowledgement that diversity and inclusion has to be included in conversations among politicians and senates and governments. Um, it has... I would say it's been acknowledged, but it hasn't been necessarily practiced. So we mm, we were just able to, I mean, practically we applied for it. There was a public tender um, in 2019, and uh, we turned in a application document of 90 pages to explain like how, uh, who we are, how we're going to go about um, community building, how we're going to go about programming, um, how many events do we want to have, like, um, share some numbers and um, some measurable kind of impact and how are we going to um, create that kind of intersectional platform that is serving as a kind of foundation for knowledge sharing that is accessible, you know, that is decolonial, that is class critical, that is considering and inclusive of people with, with different kind of um, abilities, disabilities, like I mentioned earlier, um, specifically for marginalized communities. And so if I understood correctly, you started in 2016, and then in 2020, you uh, uh, finally managed to get your space. So during these three years, since 2020, how did change your, uh, how did it change your uh, group, your community? And also mm -hmm. how you reached the audience, what kind of audience uh, mm -hmm. you reached? So in 2016, we opened a space. There's a space called Bekesh. Uh, it was a community space, super accessible. Um, it was in a working class neighborhood in Wedding. And that one was kind of moved into, or well, the idea of it moved into Uyun. The difference is Bekesh is 160 square meter. It was like a small living room, um, kind of like, yeah, in, in like a very residential area. Whereas Uyun is like this massive building with, this high-tech equipment and a massive garden, and the, like it was, it was, it's the idea was the same, but the body is different. So it comes with more opportunities and it comes with more kind of resources. 
um, than the one that we had before. The community, I would say, is very similar. And the way um, we attract the community is by kind of building trust and reflection of the community within decision-making positions of our team. 90 or 95 percent of our team is not white, is not cis, is not straight. Um, and that just happens because black and brown bodies are just excellent and we've come into um, this privileged position where we are able to um, kind of create a space for ourselves and therefore inviting people of our communities into the space without having to fear, um, ideally, without having to fear any um, racism, sexism, classism, ableism. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's more of like a, it, it's more, because it's human and it's community-centered, it was quite easy for us um, to have the reflection of diversity within the team as well as among the target audience. And I think that is, I would say, the fu fundamental part. You know, I, w I went to um, Kaisa actually in Helsinki to um, advise on how Kaisa could become more diverse and inclusive. And it's interesting um, to know that, for example, people in power could stay there for life. This is something that is quite absurd to, to me. Like, I mean, I'm in this position of artistic director and CEO, but I've set a limit of five years. So every five years, the artistic director has to change or has to leave, and the same with the CEO, just to make sure that different kind of narratives and discourses will find space when maybe it becomes too comfortable for the people in position already. Um, so every five years we rotate and then new people come in, new ideas come in, new kind of also effectiveness come in, like what is what is affecting our community now, what's urgent, like what do we need to discuss, you know, because I can't, for example, um, discuss or, or kind of um, make space to create spaces, you know, when, when I'm not affected of that group. Does that make sense? Yes, completely. And you are touching the question of, of decision making even within a structure because here in Finland now we're talking a lot about representation and so we see more and more uh, performances where they try to include um, actors with different uh, racial background or different genders but at the end who is making the decision who is be behind the walls are always the same people so the, there is still let's say a lack of trust in giving the power to, let's say, uh, to a more diverse uh, society. Still the same, uh, we can say, uh, person who have been there. And this is what we wish to create also with New Theatre Helsinki, that there's something more open where we can trust different ways of making theater or representing or encountering the audience. So mm. this, what you are saying, this example, what you are building, this for us are very good and very important because we can also take this as a, um, uh, as a model, what we could pr uh, propose here in Helsinki or in Finland. Do you want me to respond to it? If you want, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Sure. <laughs> I mean, you did mention distrust, and I think that is a problem because um, it's sourced in racism, obviously, and it's sourced in um, like all the other isms, maybe as well. Um, it is the thing is, I I want to sincerely believe that institutions in Helsinki and in Berlin or anywhere in kind of like the Western world want to be more diverse and inclusive and they want to increase representation and they've done that. They've put black people on posters, you know, that they've hired actors um, of QD BIPOC communities to be on stage, but it's only temporary representation. You know, and it's, it feels like um, 
for specifically white people, cis, straight, able-bodied, it's very, very uncomfortable to understand or acknowledge I can only really, truly contribute to diversity and inclusion if I make space. And that's where ego comes in, that's where like um, uh, a kind of uh, selfishness comes in and fear maybe also, you know, it's like I'm afraid of my, of, 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 I don't know, my existence within these spheres of power. Like why would I leave this position so that someone else can come in and then maybe fuck up? You know, so it's, um, it's, it's a conversation that we keep having with people that want to like learn from, from or like that want to use our best practice and learn from it, but it's really com uncomfortable. It's extremely, um, it takes a lot of ability to self-reflect, you know, and be like, yeah, you know, maybe I, I, maybe I just step down and make space so that people could really be the one making decisions for their own communities. I, it's uncomfortable. But change I'll, is not always comfortable. I would like to uh, to bounce back and I need also to move on to the next topic, but this is uh, so <laughs> inspiring because when you talk about, um, uh, let's say, hostility or trust or lack of trust, I mm. mean, uh, one question that we faced, when I say we, it was in a panel discussion where New Theater, I think he was involved and it was like a, a, a surprise, this question, but there was suddenly a fear that, oh, but now if we need to uh, take in on the stage, let's say, uh, uh, an actor from a, a minority community or racialized, or does, does it mean that it takes away the job from the, a professional actor? And it was like a, like a shock, like to this question, like this fear that, oh, we are now taking away the job from the professional actors. Instead of seeing this as a creating a new space of enlarging or bringing new audience, so uh, it, it felt that there is a fear that now we are taking a space away instead of mm -hmm. opening up the, the field and inviting more audience also to participate. I just wanted to share. Yeah, the, I mean, but they're also professional actors. You know, just because they're a migrant um, doesn't mean they're not professional. That's a very of, interesting question. <laughs> but it kind of reflects, I guess, um, maybe like a narrative of discomfort. So yeah, interesting. Thank you, Lona. I'm sorry, we have to move on. Uh, today the panel is quite dense. It was uh, very nice and great to have you here. Uh, again, repeat for the audience here, if you have questions, uh, we'll leave them for the end, for the uh, final discussion. But thanks again for being here today with us. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And I will move now here with our panelists present. And the next um, topic that uh, we would like to discuss today in this panel, it's the notion or the issue of multilingualism. Uh, it's very strong here in Finland, the idea that uh, theater, it's, uh, it's language, it's drama, and uh, special institutions have to defend uh, Finnish language or Swedish. So how to approach this question of uh, multilinguism? And I would like to discuss this with Vanya and with Rogerio. First, maybe we give the voice to Vanya, who actually wrote a PhD about multilinguism. So I did, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of to say, <laughs> but uh, mm, uh, where to start now? I think um, I, I come t take something and pick up something about diversity first, because uh, there's a um, one can say that there's a paradox of diversity. Uh, in Swedish, uh, there's a book, Mongfalds Paradoxen. It's a handbook for inclusive inclusion. 
Uh, and there's a quote that says that diversity does not emerge just because you mix gender and color of skin. A diversity of perspective is needed. And you touched upon that in your speech on the opening gala, uh, that perspectives it, uh, <laughs> is important in this question of diversity. What is diversity? It's not only about uh, representation, it's about different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think that the potential of multilingualism is that it brings in uh, different perspectives. Uh, languages in themselves kind of bring in different perspectives. And uh, with saying that, I do not mean that each, uh, if we talk about languages, I don't see languages in an es essentialistic way. A language does not, does not carry one culture, it carries many cultures. I don't see, you know, this essentialist way of looking, looking at cultures and languages is not my point of view in my thesis. I, uh, I see uh, language and culture as something that we do. We do a language, we use language, we use yeah, language, languages to communicate. How can we communicate? And I think also transculturalism is an interesting notion which I use because um, actually what is a culture? If we look at it, if we look at the language, there are many varieties within a culture, which I already said. And we can kind of break down things that looks like a unit. They are not most of the time. What is Finnish identity? Is that one thing? Probably not. A Swedish identity is probably not a unit in itself. And that's how I approach these questions. So, just as an introduction. Um, I started to work on multilingualism in Malmö, in south of Sweden, which is a very diverse and multilingual city. And uh, we started with um, really seeing the potential of multilingualism. We and we, I mean, uh, it was me and an Iraqi Swedish um, uh, director and uh, actress who started a theater that was called Teater Jallada. And we were very inspired by the children in Malmö, the multilingual children, and their creativity and their way of communicating with each other. And we wanted to make performances for them. So we were just, okay, how can we do that? How can we involve all the languages in this group? or this <laughs> many groups of children. So that's how we started. So we did not see languages as an obstacle or multilingualism as an obstacle. That's, uh, I really, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to see languages in that way. I see it as, as a potential to communicate in other, in other ways uh, than if we speak in one language as we do now. Uh, so that was my entrance point, and we had a really back, a good feedback from the children and from adults as well in Malmö, and they, they felt included. That was our common kind of experience out of this. Uh, they came up after the performances and spoke to the actors and say, hi, are you also, are you from Iraq? I'm also from Iraq. Uh, do you speak this language? So there was a clear connection between the audience and the actors and the, what was going on on the stage which really like told us that this is something possible to do, we should do it, it's fun. Uh, because I, I see multilingualism as a creative force actually. It's, it's, not, it's political and it's creative, very creative force. Um, <clears throat> I really would like to bounce back on the idea of perspective like that um, does theater uh, is a space for opening up perspectives or more to reinforce a certain narrative. And uh, I wish the theater is a space where we can open different type of perspectives. And when it comes about um, diversity and multilingualism, how it affects not only, let's say, the uh, immigrant or international artists, but also the population inside the, the, the country. I have this experience that I faced in Kemi. I was doing a community project in, in Kemi, so in the north, Finland, the Lapland, and there were several groups involved, and then there was a youth group, and in the youth group there was a, a girl, and we, we started to talk, and then 
the, the girl told me that actually her mother is Sami and the father is Rom. So she's able to speak Finnish, Swedish, Sami, and uh, Romanish. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Can you say some of the lines of the show in these languages? And then she would turn white, and uh, she was saying no, and she was like, come on, it's Rom, and, and, and it's Sami. So suddenly she was ashamed. She was ashamed by her own cultural background and she wanted to be Finnish. So she wanted to speak just Finnish on the stage. And so this idea of uh, diversity or opening up perspectives, um, it affects not only, let's say, the, the immigrant or international artists, but it's even the population itself. I mean, uh, when I've been working with, uh, mainly with actors, uh, groups of actors, and I always start with an exercise that is about their linguistic repertoires. And then in a group with people that you might not have any idea about that there are a lot of different cultural and linguistic backgrounds, it pops up that each and every one has maybe a much more diverse uh, background that you would ever think. So what is needed is to enhance that and, and to encourage that and, and see it as a competence uh, for an actor to have many languages or dialects or styles of languages when I think about multilingualism, it's also social acts and, and dialects and kind of styles in language, which is also a diversity. So I think uh, just to, to open up, okay, but uh, what do you speak? What languages do exist in your life? It opens up something and then one can work with that, which we did now in this workshop, me and the, the David Cosma, we had a one week workshop with multilingual actors, and we started with this exercise. And of course, we knew uh, some of the languages that they had before on forehand, but uh, that's how we started to work. What do you bring here into this room and with your, what's your background here? What's, and I think that can be done in any group, actually. I mean, I think there's so much more diversity that is not visible, that is not heard. I think so too, and um, when I, uh, work with my students at the Theater Academy. I often start uh, the year with them talking about the word to act. And I uh, analyze the word to act in different languages, in French, Italian, Finnish, and English. And I try, we try to understand, for instance, behind the word to act, in English there is an idea of will. So acting, it's a uh, question of will. And often, uh, it relates to the notion of ethics. How do I act? While in French, uh, it's jouer, which means to play, it's, there is a notion of playfulness, which brings in the no notion of uh, ritual, excess, and, and rules. And then in Italian, it's recitare. So could be translated as re-quoting. Re so the idea that you are repeating a truth so there is an idea of technique that you are able to, to repeat that. And there is a connection with um, a tradition. And then in Finnish, nautella, uh, which means uh, to show, but there is this la that is a kind of smaller somehow, if I understood correctly. So there is an idea of showing. So it's not clear for the students if this nautella, it's a humble attitude of showing, or an idea that I show this, but don't pay too much attention. I don't really. Uh, so just the idea to, uh, to look at how the word to act in different languages, uh, to what it corresponds, already enriches the idea to, of the actor, like how to be on stage. Different perspectives on, on acting and, and, and enriching the, the acting, notion of acting, yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But Rogerio, since you are also dealing with similar issues yes how you want to respond to vanya ah so many different things that i could just pick up from uh, what vanya just said but maybe i should start by um, adding one more language to your <laughs> <laughs> to your little exercise uh, in portuguese we also have a tour so to act but uh, when we refer to theater usually we use the word representar so to represent 
So there's almost like a double representation on stage when we refer to what the, what the actor does on a stage. So sometimes it represents himself or herself or themselves. Sometimes it represents an idea of something. So this idea of theater as a representation, um, it's quite strong, uh, I think, in the Western world, not just in uh, my country. Um, and I would like to suggest uh, that multilingualism um, could be like uh, a creative force, just like you said, uh, or a strategy to sort of overcome the idea that, that theater should represent something. Because every time we do something on stage, we are always representing something, even if we are just playing ourselves, like telling our stories from a very personal, almost autobi autobiographic point of view, so to speak. Um, so it's always the representation of something. And I think that uh, what makes some people uncomfortable when they cannot understand what's being said on stage, it's because somehow the idea of understanding the meaning of what is being said, it's crucial for uh, the idea that we have about what theater is, what the theater as representation should be. Uh, we were discussing before the panel, me and Vanya, about the idea that text is very important in theater because it, it, it somehow conveys this idea of a national identity. So that's why the, the language of the country, if it's just one, it can be more like your country, for instance, should be like the core point um, of what should be uh, uh, promoted, what should be uh, sponsored, what should be funded. Um, so in Finland, it's quite obvious that it should be the Finnish language and to a certain extent also the Swedish language. Um, but I'm interested in understanding how can we go beyond the presence of language um, and try to find other functions, other operations for the idea of speaking and saying things. So I really truly believe that um, even the, the simple operation of translating a performance, which we probably all have gone through to um, at some point in our careers, uh, when we go abroad and we have to translate our shows if it has text. Uh, the idea of subtitling, interpreting, uh, putting a caption, uh, creating different meanings. So just this alone can be like a very interesting way to sort of expand the possibilities of, of theater. Um, and I really truly believe that we should also try to uh, overcome um, this, um, this idea that, that theater should be all about um, the text and the repertoire, as the Gorky uh, dramaturges was, was talking about, uh, we should also try to search for other stories, for other narratives, and we should also create our own narratives. I think that the fact that we keep on playing the repertoire because it's important, because you know it goes again, um, it, it sort of conveys the idea of a national identity. We should also try to um, probably like invite playwrights to start writing about other stories and other narratives to sort of like reflect what the society is. Um, and I think that uh, what makes also people uncomfortable is when they kind of see the reality that they see in their everyday lives um, happening in front of them on the stage because that's, what, that's not what we expect. Or somehow we expect like a polished, safe, um, photoshopped version of reality that it's not harmful, it's not gonna confront you with something that you are not prepared to listen to. And I would just like to introduce like this um, situation that happened quite recently in Portugal. There was a um, director who decided to make a show um, inspired by uh, All About My Mother, the uh, Pedro Almodovar's movie, uh, that has uh, at least two trans uh, characters, including that very iconic, famous one, Agrado, who has that uh, beautiful uh, speech in the beginning of the movie. Uh, but the character Agrado was played by um, a cis um, a straight uh, actor. Um, there was a big demonstration, there was a big discussion online, and in one of the shows in Lisbon, the stage was invaded by a trans activist who happens to be Brazilian, uh, brown, uh, and a prostitute. Uh, so everything's wrong. <laughs> everything's wrong. It was a big scandal. 
Um, and it's funny that all of a sudden everyone was not talking about what happened from a political point of view. Everyone all of a sudden was talking about what theater is and should be. Like the sacred dimension of the stage that should never be uh, invaded by something that comes, comes from the outside. As if, as if she was like interrupting some kind of spiritual thing that should never be bothered. Uh, and it's funny that she is a grado. She is like an agrado representative of what we can see in society outside of, like in, in the real world. So people are perfectly fine with the idea of someone representing an idea of agrado, but they don't want to see a real one in that same place where the other one is playing. So I think that we should try to also look at theater in an anti-representational point of view. And I think that multilingualism can be a means towards that. Thanks. Uh, I feel, Giovanni, you want to respond just to say this. There was a similar um, um, event in Finland, exactly the same question uh, that uh, sees me, the actor was playing the transgender, I think the same um, project. It did not, I don't think there has been a big question about what's the entity of the national theater in Finland and what should the national theater represent. It was just about the representation itself. The discussion did not open to a larger scale as you propose now. Uh, wow, yeah, um, I think um, my thought was that, uh, yeah, also uh, people or audiences or we as um, working in the performing arts field uh, also are not uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a bit awkward to work with multilingualism because it's, um, it's not about, um, okay, let's bring uh, French, English and Arabic together in the same piece, but it will mix and it will create something new. And this is very confusing what is happening there because that is against the purity of languages, the idea that languages should be kept pure if there is something like purity in the language uh, and it should not mix. So this uh, notion of mixing things like that is very uh, disturbing and can be very provoking, I think. But I mean, that is an experience. I, mm, I would say that multilingualism in the performing arts, it's not only about the l one language in itself, it's about the multilingual experience that so many people have in their lives. You described very nicely, at the, again, at the gala, how you live with many languages. So I think that if you, as an audience, come to the theater and you see a multilingual performance, even if you don't know the languages involved, you can see, okay, this is my life, maybe. This is how I work, talk with my friends or with my family. We mix languages. So that it's also an experience, experience in itself this way of living and it can be, it is disturbing, it is provoking, even for me. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, hiding that it's difficult sometimes, it is. But I think the difficulty is also where creativity comes in. Thanks, Vanya. I look at the time, I will stop here. <laughs> But these are very uh, provocative questions that you are raising, and I think these are very good um, thoughts also for, um, for us, like why to use multilingualism and what do we want to achieve? Is it just to give space uh, for immigrant artists, international artists, or is it a way to reconsider what is the space of theater? What is the way to we discuss community together? Or how we reconsider how do we live together? That's maybe the bottom line question. Um, how, do we li how do we live together? How do we do theater together? Uh, I would like to go now with uh, Yasmin and Anna who have been both collaborating on different surveys about um, discrimination or representation uh, among the actors. Uh, or in the music field. Maybe we'll start with Yasmin. Uh, please. 
Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I feel bad because it's been a really inspiring conversation about what's going on in the world, in Berlin and Sweden and all this wonderful work that's been happening. And now I'm bringing you uh, some results of the survey we did with the Finnish Actors Union last year about what's going on in Finland. And it doesn't look quite as good, so brace yourselves. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we did this survey uh, last year with the Finnish Actors Union, Näyttelijä Liitto, about the ethnic and cultural uh, diversity in the acting field. And uh, yeah, I can uh, quickly first go through the results with you and give you a little bit of background of that. Uh, so yes, uh, we started working with the equality group in uh, 2013. 20, well, 2021, and then we started working with the survey in 22, and then we published the results in the autumn of 22. And we chose to work with ethnic and cultural diversity for this first survey, of course, understanding that uh, discrimination is very intersectional, uh, but we just wanted to focus on something specific, and this uh, ethnic and cultural diversity was a point uh, where the Actors' Union hadn't been doing any kind of work before, so that's why we chose that. And uh, yes, so the survey revealed that there is a lot of discrimination and racism in the acting industry. And uh, that didn't surprise me, <laughs> uh, but of course the results are and the numbers are quite shocking and the people's actual experiences are quite sad and shocking. And there were three main points that I would like to present to you from the survey that would maybe help us understand a little bit of the situation and what needs to change in the field in Finland. Uh, so the main point is that uh, racism and discrimination are still not even recognized or intervened. Uh, so in w workplaces, uh, they are not aware of the problems and the employers do not seem to recognize their own responsibility. Uh, so that was very clear. And uh, so to give you some numbers, 67% of ethnic minorities stated in the survey that they feel that it's not clear to everyone in their working community what is condescending or discriminatory language. So that's our starting point. Uh, it's not even clear what is uh, discriminatory and what is uh, what you can say and what is offending to somebody and 83% uh, of the respondents belonging to ethnic minorities stated that the directors and executives do not have norm critical training uh, or knowledge um, so yeah they face uh, the respondents that belong to ethnic minorities faced a lot of discrimination uh, some of it was, for example, name-calling, bullying, exclusion, racist jokes, and other forms of discrimination. For example, uh, a, a direct quote from one of the respondents what was that the N-word is still being used in my workplace, also by the executives. And another quote that I think is quite revealing of the uh, kind of atmosphere that's going on in the acting field was from one respondent that said, uh, people are afraid of offending minorities, so for the sake of their own comfort, they keep the minorities outside. So there is this kind of atmosphere that you don't really, they don't really know what's okay to say on uh, like uh, what to do. So instead of finding out how to be more inclusive, it is easier for the people making the decisions to keep the minorities outside for their own comfort. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that workplaces lack strategies for handling discrimination. So that came out with most of the respondents did not know who to contact when discrimination occurs. So there are not clear instructions, there are not clear uh, uh, places to go when discrimination occurs. Uh, so it is very evident from uh, the survey that we need clear directions and clear tools on how to handle uh, discrimination. Uh, and the third point is 
uh, that also casting and programming does not pay attention to discriminatory practices. So even before we get into the whole uh, work community, uh, it is actually much harder for ethnic minorities and cultural minorities and language minorities uh, to even find work uh, in Finland. And 83% of ethnic minorities reported that they have less work opportunities because of their background. And they do not think that diversity and norm criticism is considered when making decisions of the program. And again, one quite touching quote uh, from the survey goes like this. A producer has said to me that I am not as relatable to Finnish people because of the color of my skin. And that's uh, kind of very clear. I can relate to that experience as a minority actor in Finland. It is quite clear that the producers and the casting professionals uh, have this really strong mindset that's because you look different, you are not relatable, and therefore you cannot be the main character. You can maybe be the sidekick or the bad guy, but you are not relatable to the Finnish community. Uh, yes, so that's the sad truth of where we are. And uh, another thing that comes back to your wonderful point of the question that somebody asked in the panel this question, discussion. Uh, so now they are taking the jobs away from the professional actors. And that's the reality that we minority actors are not seen quite as professional as uh, the Finnish actors. Uh, and that comes down to also the point that was revealed in the survey that uh, the industry doesn't value uh, education from abroad as much as uh, education in Finland. So only actors who have graduated from the theatre schools here in Finland are considered to be professional actors. And uh, if you have trained somewhere else, you are not seen as a professional Mm, and you are not even given the possibilities. And yes, uh, that's that's a very sad point, I think. And I can really uh, personally also uh, kind of relate to that. And coming uh, uh, coming back from my personal experience of coming after being, I'm Finnish, but I trained abroad and then came back. And it really, really, in London, when I, while I was working after graduation, I was considered a professional actor, of course, because I had trained professionally. And then it really uh, changed. It was a really kind of a knock on my professional identity when I moved back to Finland, my home country. And suddenly, I was not even considered a professional. I became invisible in the industry. Yes, uh, so that's the sad reality we are facing. Sorry for taking all of you from this really <laughs> inspiring conversation to this. Uh, but yes, of course, uh, the Actors' Union is very concerned and very saddened to hear these experiences. And we want to continue working with these issues. And the Actors' Union is now putting in place a long-term plan to how to tackle these issues. And we want to... Uh, work with other organizations and we are already making plans of working with other organizations because it's also important to do this together with the people who are in charge uh, of the funding and in charge of the casting for example thanks thanks Yasmin um, Anna <laughs> how, how is it in the in the music field <laughs> Well, I could have just uh, put word uh, musicians or music field in your speech and then I could be quiet <laughs> because uh, it's so similar, yeah. So uh, Finnish music scene made also a survey last year. Uh, it came out uh, in spring uh, 22 and there were many, many uh, music organizations behind this survey and uh, uh, the industry wanted to know uh, the reality of of equality and uh, uh, inclusiveness and diversity in uh, Finnish music scene, and as you said, uh, it wasn't. Uh, it was shocking, but not unexpected. Yeah. Um, compared to your survey, this survey was a little bit more wider uh, with the topic of diversity and inclusiveness. So it wasn't only uh, tackling the, the ethnic minorities or ethnic diversity. So it was also like sexual uh, harassment and the gender issues, gender balance, 
Uh, but yes, there was also the same uh, ethnic diversity topic that was um, uh, asked about. And the, the shocking numbers were that 75% uh, of those who are working as the professionals in Finnish music scene has uh, experienced some kind of harassment um, and discrimination. And, well, I don't have those exact numbers now with me, uh, but just to point out that it was mainly a uh, young generation, uh, female professionals, and uh, those who have ethnic background, who mentioned that they have uh, experienced the discrimination. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, interesting topics today, a lot from Germany and here, and, and so many things to talk about. Um, about new narratives. Um, I will bring another angle to that uh, from my own personal experience. Uh, as I said, I'm Finnish-Bulgarian myself. I'm born in Finland, uh, but because of my parents, uh, they decided to make this love decision and, you know, start the family, and that's why I came to this country. Uh, I grew up um, with two languages in my home, Finnish and Bulgarian, but outside of my home, um, there was only Finland and Finnish, Finnish language. So I was born in the area where it was basically 100% Finnish speaking area. Uh, and this, uh, we have talked about the repre representation and uh, national identity, and uh, these were kind of um, non topics to me when I was living home, but when I grew up and moved away and uh, in my first university city here in Finland, I was addressed uh, in English language on the street or like where you come from. And then I answered in Finnish uh, and with my dialect, with my very heavy Northern Finnish dialect back then, that I come from this small town. Uh, and then the question was like, yes, but like, where are you originally from? <laughs> So, okay, I couldn't joke then because it was so shocking, but I could have said that, okay, it was Urheilutia 28, and then, you know, that's, that's my address, you can go there. But, uh, so, <laughs> from that point, I started my personal kind of uh, project to identify myself and to realize that even though I was born in this country, I am going through the same topics uh, and same experiences that people who have moved to, the, moved to this country. I mean, they were not new to me because my father is Bulgarian musician who moved to Finland, so I also grew up with, this, with these topics, basically. So, uh, coming back to this, uh, for example, representation. Um, uh, well, Finnish language is very small language in the, in the world and uh, they say that in order to succeed in Finland as a musician and as a performer in the music field, you have to do it in Finnish. That's like, you, you, you just have to do it. Or in Swedish, if, you are, if your market is the Swedish-speaking Finland. Uh, but what, what about those even Finnish-born people who decide to make the the artwork, the music in English, or whatever language, French, Bulgarian, whatever, uh, it means that this country doesn't have like a market for that kind of uh, creativity. Yes, that's my humble <laughs> <laughs> statement. Yeah, now we are kind of touching a question that uh, Roger, you mentioned, uh, does the theater or art in general represents a narrative about the country or uh, should art question this narrative and propose a um, way that overcome issues of representation or overcome uh, fixed normative discourse. This is a, a big, big, big question that we should start. <laughs> we should start, <laughs> otherwise uh, it affects because this I think uh, the, the Finnish society, in my experience, is facing this clash between a certain type of na narrative about what is Finnish identity, which probably it's an heritage from the Talvisota, the Winter War, and the idea that uh, it's an homogenous country. But this narrative doesn't fit anymore with the reality. Uh, the reality is different. And uh, we are constantly living this clash. And there isn't yet, 
a new narrative that has emerged. So I think it's probably also a task for us to suggest uh, alternative uh, narratives or to reconsider what is Finnish identity. Yeah, <laughs> we should <laughs> we should do that. Uh, yeah, from the actor's point of view and from the acting community's point of view, it comes down to this question of uh, also of the new narratives and who can present these new narratives. Uh, because, uh, for example, in the institutional theatres in uh, Finland, if they are bringing some new narrati narratives, they are presented by the ensemble, who is, of course, very white, very Finnish, very certain type of actors. And then we have this really, really touchy subject of who can play what's going on. Uh, and even that, when we are having this discussion usually, it comes from a certain narrative. And the narrative is this of usually of the white male or can be white female or somebody else. But, but if we put the stereotype there, it's the white male who is afraid that they cannot do their job of acting anymore, that they are, uh, okay, so now I cannot play this and I can pl not play that, and it's, I'm an actor, do I have to murder somebody to act, play a murderer? That's the narrative. <laughs> uh, yeah, th that, that is, yeah. Uh, but I think we should flip the narrative uh, upside down because that's not really the issue. If we were working in a level playing field, if we all had the same opportunities, then that wouldn't be an issue. Then nobody would get offended uh, if you play a minority, for example, if we were all uh, in the equal playing field. Uh, so, yeah, we should look at who, who are these actors who do not have these opportunities to play anybody else, but they're uh, color of their skin or their accent or something like that. And when we work in a truly equal, diverse uh, acting community, then it's not a problem and you don't have to worry about this thing. But, uh, but coming back to the narratives, even that conversation of who can I portray on stage, it's usually from the perspective of the white, Finnish, very like... Uh, people who don't belong to a lot of minorities. And, and I understand that fear, uh, the same fear that will they take the job from us professionals. It's, it's the same fear uh, because the industry, of course, uh, is uh, there are not enough jobs for us as it is. Uh, so yeah, I can understand that fear, but also we should look at, again, what you were having such a nice conversation uh, there about who has the power, and if you do have the power, are you willing to give it away to create a more inclusive community? Thanks, thanks. Would you like to uh, Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. I can't be just, you know, silent here because you just <laughs> make it so perfect. But uh, if, if the platform is equal, then we wouldn't have this conversation because then it's based on... Uh, you, well, you know, your ability, like your talent, that that should be the only thing that matters. And uh, because we are doing art, so that's the only thing. The equality is if we have the equal equal uh, platform for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Yasmin and Anna. I would like uh, to. I'm I'm sorry to put pressure. Uh, but we still have one panelist present, Nori Varga, and I would like to give the, the space to Nori uh, that she can tell us about the experience with the, the theater of the future and what kind of challenges you, you have faced, you and also Yasmin, and uh, what kind of story also the, the youth they, they want to tell. Yes, thank you. And thanks a lot for these really, really deep and crucial points, I think, uh, we heard. Uh, I was thinking what kind of nice uh, connective line I could start with, and then I thought that it's actually uh, really... Um, I think it's, we are really privileged that we are working with the youth because it gives us a lot of hope. So after this nice, like... Uh, uh, 
discussion about the statistics, uh, the really sad and uh, horrid <laughs> statistics, uh, I have to say that I have the feeling that our groups, uh, the students we are working with, they have a really different relation to these topics. So I am really positive about this, that there is a change coming and no one can stop this change. They sorry, sorry, Nori, could you explain which group are you working with and yes. who are the... Yes. Uh, so we have currently three youth groups uh, within New Theatre Helsinki and uh, two out of the three groups are in different outer districts of Helsinki, one in Olynkula and one in Kannamaki. We are cooperating with the Nori Sotalo system, uh, which is the youth centres of Helsinki and we have the third group in Lapinlaadan Lade uh, Cultural Centre. Uh, and uh, m our students are mainly from the districts uh, we mentioned, but of course not uh, just. Uh, and uh, we meet weekly, and we have a yearly structure. We do theatre, we uh, use and practice different uh, genres within theatre, and uh, our age group is uh, between 12 and 18 and uh, we focus on the narratives they would like to talk about, they bring in. Uh, but speaking of the narratives, uh, I can already like dig into the slippery slopes of the project, uh, because this is, I think, a really shocking experience of ours, that, um, that uh, the narratives can be often uh, really conservative, uh, speaking of genres of theatre they would like to work with. Of course, we are living in a society and of, co of course the educational system also adds to this. Uh, but we kind of try to give the students the support and the confidence and the feeling of community that they are brave enough to speak about the issues they are actually uh, interested in. Uh, and I think we have quite a diverse group of students. So uh, the topics are also now starting to be really diverse and it's really interesting because even though they are from the same age group, uh, they have, all three groups have kind of different uh, uh, interests. Uh, and of course the general teenager uh, problems and difficulties uh, came up. So the relationship with the parents, parenting, uh, the bullying, the group dynamics in school. But also we have uh, some uh, interesting, like how to uh, re relate to the events happening around us, uh, to news, to, mer to aggression, uh, to a society that's kind of uh, not as tolerant, as not as uh, inclusive as they wishing for, uh, and um, so on. So it's kind of really a wide range. But I can say one thing, which is really, which gives us a lot of hope, is that I think that they overcame certain narratives we just heard uh, about uh, before. Of course, I also have to say that our groups are really small, are pretty small. Uh, we have all together 20 students uh, in these three groups and uh, we are wishing for more and uh, this is again another slippery slope because we do a really hard work to gather new students but it's extremely hard and uh, it's also a bit frightening uh, because when we visited these outer districts of Helsinki, we experienced that the students' opinion about theater is just devastating. They hear the word theater and they have a really, really clear facial expression sometimes. <laughs> you know that there is a huge work to, to be done uh, they have a lot of stereotypical thoughts about theatre 
And uh, some of them are coming uh, from their families. Uh, some of them are uh, coming uh, based on their traumas from school because they are forced to go to see certain performances. And we just heard like about the lack of uh, certain narratives. So of course, uh, if they are forced to sit uh, through a really long play in a really rigid building for hours in silence, uh, and uh, they are uh, always like hushed, and uh, uh, even though they have a discussion, hopefully that opens up about what they saw, but they see a play which is really old and traditional, and they cannot relate. It's really, really hard for them to connect to the genre. And it's really dangerous. It's really dangerous because then uh, connecting them back to art field, it's extremely hard. So maybe now I try to like kind of list uh, everything because I know that we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but uh, feel free to ask questions later and I can open up certain like uh, topics. I just quickly, I don't know, showed around. Yeah, thanks, uh, Nori. This is um, <clears throat> a big, big issue because it seems that um, when talking also with Yasmin about this experience, the, also among the students who are actually interested in coming, then there are some uh, difficulties to follow the classes because being from some areas of Helsinki, there are this pressure from the community, from the other students, but then there are issues uh, at home. So actually there are a lot of structural elements that prevent students to follow uh, to the class while other students from other areas of Helsinki, Punavuori, don't face the same issues. So for someone from Punavuori, it's much easier to follow a theater class than someone from Kandelmaki. And it's not even a question of interest. It's really that the structure of the neighborhood uh, it's discriminating or not. Yes, and I would, I would like to just refer back to what Ivo said also, that it's really important that this work is a community work. So it's, it's a much bigger challenge because if we include the students, we include the parents. If we include the parents, we try to include also the community. So I think it's really important for us all to realize that it's not just about certain theaters, certain theater pieces, certain, certain artists or certain narratives. It's like, uh, I think it's a much bigger issue. It's also about our society we are living in. And I think it's really, really important that we just, we are really aware of that uh, it's like a hard work, it's a really, really difficult work. It's a really slow work, but it's an important work and it's for the community. So it's a bigger kind of a range of people uh, we should uh, take into consideration and work with. Thanks, I, I would like to believe that uh, theater is a space where we can reflect on the community and we can feel uh, that we are all citizens of Helsinki and not that only certain people are citizens of Helsinki and the others are invisible. I think this is what, why with uh, David Cosma we started this project, New Theatre Helsinki, is that for a long time we were living here and we felt that we were just invisible and we thought it was our problem, that we were not good enough. <laughs> and then, and this is why we were not noticed, and then we realized that actually we were not the only ones struggling, living the similar situation, and then we, we realized that actually it was not our problem, but it was a structural problem, that um, if you don't belong to a certain, let's say, clan, you are not visible. And so this whole initiative about New Theatre Helsinki is to bring together these different realities and mm -hmm. make them visible. And this is what we are trying to do. Um, I think it's time, thanks Nori, I, I think it's Thank time you. to maybe open this discussion for uh, our audience who is present or here at home. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, please raise your hand, I will give the mic. 
Hello. Uh, I have a question. I try to formulate it. I have a thought, but it's not clear yet. Uh, the last few, uh, Yasmin and Anna, talked about the kind of, uh, you talked more about the business side, and you kind of uh, went there too with the idea of if you are not relatable, you are not selling ticket or something. So um, maybe this question is, uh, you can both answer, but maybe in the context of theater for you, uh, do you think it's true? Like, do you think that those bosses that have the preconceived notion that, oh, you are too exotic, people cannot relate to you, do you think it's true? <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> And if, it's, if it is true, what would be the solution to that? Because we live in this capitalist society. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, my immediate response was going to be that it's absolutely not true at all. Uh, but I think the, the question is a bit more difficult than that. Uh, well, for myself, certainly, I didn't see much people uh, growing up. I didn't see people looking like me or coming from diverse backgrounds in the TV, certainly not in the Finnish TV or theater. And I still related to a lot of characters. But uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of studies about, especially in America, and it's a different kind of com mm, society, but still it's, it, it re reflects to the same issue where, uh, for example, there's this really interesting study made in the U.S. that if you're a black person watching TV in the U.S., it doesn't matter what channel you watch, but it is directly linked to depression. The more TV you watch, the more likely you are to be depressed because the representation of black people is so negative in all of the media. Uh, so, yes, the representation does matter. Uh, but so I think the issue is that everybody in the society should be represented. Uh, if we go out now from the door to Helsinki, uh, uh, and if we compare the people we see walking on the street, the people we see on, uh, I was going to say a theater's name, but I don't want to pin. If we go to any institutional theater in, uh, in Helsinki or in the whole of Finland uh, and see who's on stage, who's in the ensemble, uh, they don't compare. They don't reflect each other. So I think it's... Uh, First, we should focus on uh, having the diversity that we already have in our society and put it on stage or put it on screen. Uh, but to answer your question, I think representation of different people who look different or who speak different is important, uh, but you can uh, relate to somebody who doesn't have the same skin color as you. I think. I have, for, sh for sure. So, yes. They are wrong. <laughs> yes, yes, I would say they are wrong, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I certainly believe that, yeah. Well, if I just continue a few words about it, and, well, I can't say for sure, because there are quite of many people working in Finnish music scene, so uh, if it's true or not, but I can tell you from my personal experience that, yes, I have heard that my music, for example, uh, they say that we don't know to whom we would sell it. And I'm not the only one hearing this, this uh, feedback uh, about the music that was made in Finland for the Finnish audience. And my opinion is that, well, if you don't know it, who does? Because that's your work. You have to find the audience because the audience is there. It doesn't matter that... Uh, and I mean, I come back to this, um, was it Lola who said that we have to have different people making the decisions. Um, so that would be probably one uh, solution also the Finnish music scene, that there would be uh, different people, diverse people making the decisions to, uh, to the playlist, who is going to perform on the festivals, what kind of language you hear on the radio stations. So, yeah. This is the reality, at least from my point of view. Um. Sorry. 
Yeah, sorry, I have a, a question. Uh, I'm Brazilian, living here for 20 years. Uh, I did a lot of theater with uh, immigrants, uh, uh, kids, and we had this cooperative called Sumart. I think some people here heard about it. But sometimes I feel as a foreigner, even if I got the Finnish citizenship, that us, you know, all of us, that we are uh, in a kind of outside uh, area, if we could get uh, together to help each other, try to, you know, make an association uh, to try to apply for projects together, because I think it's missing a little bit that sometimes you are alone applying for grants, and sometimes, you know, I miss, uh, would be great to have a kind of structure that we could work more together in a way to help each other because we are all in the same boat. And sometimes I think that is missing a little bit of that in Finland. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a question for you. <laughs> well, um, this is why we created New Theater Helsinki, exactly to bring together and uh, you are talking about your own experience. Uh, we are planting living similar, similar experience and we should just come together. And then to go to what Anna was saying and to relate also to your intervention, this fear of taking away jobs or to who to sell. I think, for instance, just Helsinki, 14% of the population in Helsinki does not uh, use Finnish or Swedish as a main language. So it's like 150,000 people. And these 150,000 people uh, probably uh, don't go to the theater because they don't feel that theater is made for them. So this is a big potential of, it's like almost uh, uh, a new theater. So I don't think it's a question of how, about taking away jobs. It's more a question about how to open the, the field and how to make it more inclusive then it's a question of how to sell yeah. this. So then it's also about us to find new strategies because we should not, as you, as you were saying, like it's not about a theater promoting a certain type of narrative, certain type of hegemonic uh, normative about a state, but it's more a theater that is uh, inviting and being diverse. So we need to find other channels to reach the different audience. And yeah, the, it goes to the communities, how to make theater as a positive experience and not like a stressful, <laughs> traumatizing experience where you see something that is not talking to you, but it's something, a space that you can see yourself. If I may ask something, just very quickly. Um, I think that what you're saying uh, is part of this trajectory that uh, we are probably already going through. Um, so I think that um, I'm also hopeful, uh, even though I don't work with uh, kids. Um, I think th things will probably change and might change. Um, but th since we are in this trajectory, we should also be very careful and critical of, of, of what, what is going on around us and what we are doing. Uh, because there's always the danger of creating um, an even more sectorized society. Um, so I think that projects like New Theory Helsinki are extremely important. Like, there's absolutely no doubts about that. Um, but we should also always be very careful to not close ourselves too much within our own universes. Even when it comes to marketing, I think that we should also try to force a way to market to those markets that probably are absolutely not interested at all, but they might be interested at all. And also like uh, probably contributing to what you were asking, Davide, I, I feel that there's a lack of this kind of intersectional collaborations, like um, companies who are mostly um, Finnish companies or um, made by Finnish people, um, I think that they should also be a little bit more open to what are the other professionals that live in, uh, in Helsinki. Not just the actors, but also like dramaturgs and dramaturgists and directors and consultants and like all different kinds of professional activities uh, that exist. And I think that it would be very, very beneficial for, for those companies to collaborate. 
And I honestly think from my personal experience that there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know if it's because of maybe you are not as much of a professional as we want it to be uh, compared to what we are or we consider as professionalism. But I, I, I always feel that there's like an obstacle, there's like a resistance, uh, a suspicion um, about what you do, what you can do, what you can bring, uh, like what kind of positive things can you bring to this kind of artistic process that we are now starting. I can only imagine like being an actor, it might be even more complicated because of the reasons that we have just discussed. So yes, I think that we should also like keep an eye on the outside of this little bubble that we are creating because I think that the bubble sometimes needs to burst <laughs> and explode. Can I just say a small sentence? Um, I totally agree with you. Um, what I have experienced and I've heard from many of my colleagues that when you have a um, background, like a minority background, for example, here in Finland in music scene, you are quite often put in this exotic box. Yeah. It doesn't matter what kind of genre in music uh, you are actually doing, but since you are uh, you know, people of color or you have oriental background or whatever, you are put in the exotic box and you do, do the traditional music and your only audience is this minority group that has the same cultural uh, background. But that's not the truth. There is still a lot of other issues to, to think about. someone from the audience yes thank you so much this was a dense package but incredibly important discussion i think and i'm a migration scholar and i'm a postdoc at helsinki university and i am working on highly skilled migrants and them being invisible is actually one of the findings and in my new research i'm focusing on the creative migrants in finland and their like art of becoming citizens so through their art how do they become citizens and you know, the democratic participation. But at the same time, I'm a former theater actress and a documentary maker, so I'm trying to understand the Finnish scene. And to me, what you said is so important. For example, I, I, I am also um, representing Finland in Nordic Ministry of, uh, Nordic Council of Ministers in integration uh, issues in the migrant forum. And the next meeting is on arts and culture. How can we establish this in the Nordic? Uh, region. So I'm here today as a researcher from the university and someone representing Finland in the Nordic region and I will take this and the case of new, uh, new theatre to, to my research but to the Nordic uh, Council as well. So it's so important to reach the gatekeepers so I think I really do believe like not only diversity and in, like inclusivity in theater, but diversity and inclusivity in other sectors and, and in lawmaking and so on is so important because this is what makes the um, impact. And um, I, I would like maybe Vanya to reflect a bit upon this multiculturalism aspect because I do believe that multiculturalism that is not grounded in civic laws and uh, rights is messy multiculturalism. So for the case of Finland, how can we go beyond this messy culturalism? Like what, what kind of laws and rights can be implemented? Um, any reflections on that would be really cool, thank you. Wow, that's a question I cannot <laughs> <laughs> reply because I have so little knowledge about Finnish. Uh, laws uh, since I'm living in Sweden, so uh, I'm sorry. I will have to pass that on to someone. The Swedish perspective. Yeah, what would be, what would we do in Sweden? I mean, now s s I, I, I don't know, but maybe it felt like I brought up one example from from Malmö that was a kind of positive uh, example now, but I would say that we have the same issues and problems in Sweden as here. It's of course different, but, but uh, there are a lot of uh, lack of diversity in the Swedish performing arts field as well, and I, I do uh, recognize what you are talking about. Uh, but uh, c can you maybe uh, repeat your question or make it more accessible for me? So. <laughs> I can make it accessible for all of you because I think the survey was also really interesting in that sense because uh, there is, can we create a control mechanism? For example, if an 
actor hears discriminatory words, where do, does that actor go to? <laughs> to whom? You know. So how can we implement these things? Some top-down do approach where this power is being kind of checked in a way. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, that's the work that we should be doing. Um, so there has been a lot of talk about these creating these guidelines. For example, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the UK's equity. So the Actors Union in, in the UK, they have these guidelines for inclusive casting, and they. Uh, so that's one thing that we wanted to work with these clear guidelines uh, in the union, and we want to do it with the. Uh, employers together with the employees, so the theatre directors and all of that, because of course uh, it needs to come from both sides. And then we have been looking at what other countries and what other unions have been doing abroad, because we don't really, we don't have experience of doing this work. Uh, so I think uh, a lot of the, uh, one really interesting thing that we uh, uh, learned from looking at other countries is that it's, it's included in the communal bargaining agreements, so in the työehtosopimukset. Uh, so it's directly included. Of course, we have a law that says it's illegal to discriminate, but it's still happening. So, it, yeah, it's included in the actual uh, communal bargaining agreements. So that's one thing that I think we could be doing, and these guidelines, and yes, these clear channels of how you can report. Uh, but we are only starting this work, sadly we are <laughs> a bit behind of some other countries uh, in that sense. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's only at a starting point that we are now looking at these different kind of ways uh, of how to deal with that. Did that answer your question, even a little bit? <laughs> I see someone, uh, can I? Uh, quickly, no, 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 I was thinking of you, but I would like also to answer your, your, um, your point. Um, and this is a, a big, uh, big question, like what kind of guidelines, because, uh, I mean, Helsinki, yes, is becoming much more diverse, but at the same time, it's becoming much more polarized. And in the last two years, a lot of uh, gangs start to happen, in the, especially in the eastern part of Helsinki. So actually, there isn't at all a, di a dialogue happening. But on the opposite, it's uh, segregating even more. So one big question that we are asking ourselves is like, uh, what do we aim to do with, for instance, New Theatre Helsinki, and not so much about, you were talking about multiculturalism, because there is a, maybe a danger that, OK, uh, East Helsinki, Itakeskus, Ita becomes this bubble of uh, Eastern people, uh, international people, and they stay there, and there isn't actually a dialogue. So we would like to build bridges. So we talk about interculturalism, and what you are saying, it's, it's really important for us. Because the, the big issue, when you were talking, uh, the difficulties, uh, the community, we are facing this situation, like I live in Amulupuro, which is next to uh, Itakeskus, and you see uh, these young guys and these gangs, and they say, yeah, look how the terrorists are coming. So even though they are Finnish, born here, but they completely internalize the, the rhetoric that is said about them. And instead of then playing the victim, they embody that and they vindicate. Look, we are the terrorists now, watch out. And this is very sad because there is not at all a dialogue. There is just a polarization. There is no any option. If we talk about guidelines, maybe the issue of S2, second language, this is a big, big problem. Uh, like at the age of seven, you basically, your future is kind of determined. So, and uh, if you end up in this S2 um, line, a lot of doors are blocked. And then you think that you take your own decision. Okay, I don't go to study, it's my own decision. But actually you just internalized uh, structural discrimination that the society has imposed on you. So this is like what Bourdieu talks about, the translation discrimination. So, and even though Finland has this rhetoric of being open society where everybody has a chance, there are these invisible discriminations, and this is the most obvious, that are present. But if you are not faced to that, you think that they don't exist. 
So the, what kind of discourse we, we make about uh, immigrants or children of immigrants, this S2 line, for instance, these are kind of concrete elements. Hi, my, my name is Rita Pakvalena. I work at Culture for All that works with, with helping organizations uh, in issues uh, regarding uh, accessibility and diversity and, and inclusion. Uh, you were asking about what are there. Of course, there are legislation. Of course, this is totally all of this that we've been talking about. It's, it's against the law. <laughs> So, so yes, we have we have all all those legislations. So we don't need so much more. Uh, what we need is is tools how to to work, how to address things, how to make things visible. And I think, for example, uh, the uh, how do you say Yhdenvertaisuus ja tasa arvo plans, the the equity plans, like like not only on on paper, like not only those dead papers, but but actually. Like, like plans that are, are in your daily life, the way you work. Uh, and now, uh, just a few weeks, uh, just a week ago, there was the ethical guidelines was published. So there are all, all kinds of guidelines, but I think that the organizations need to have their own plans. They need to have their own plans that the whole, the whole working community is committed to, plans that you go through once, twice a year, and it doesn't matter if you're a small organization. We also have an a, a equity plan, although we are, now we are 10, but when we did the, the equity plan, we were five people. And I think that having that kind of uh, guideline, uh, not the guideline, but plan, something like, like something that you work with in your daily life, and, and you go through it, and you, you have out people from, from the outside, Discussing it with you, you have you take people in in to train you, your staff to, to, and and like seeing it as a process, something that that we are never done. Like 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 regardless of our backgrounds or regardless of our knowledge, we always need more knowledge. We always need to question ourselves, question our positions, uh, regardless of what we come from or what kind of baggage we have, because we are we are always in the process of learning and relearning, and we have to rethink things all, all the time. Yeah, can I jump in a little bit? That's absolutely true, and it, it, it is true, and it's, uh, it's of course, uh, this discrimination is illegal, and it's also in the law that if you are an organization employing five or more people, you have to have this, like, equality plans. Uh, ten, is it ten? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 30, okay, I got this completely wrong. But anyway, it's in the law that you should have it. Uh, but then it's a matter of taking it off the paper and actually implementing it. And then again, training is something that uh, is really helpful in that and that the organization should be doing. And that's kind of our one of our starting points in the Actors' Union as well. So yeah, it's, it's a really good point that there are these guidelines and there are the laws and uh, the plans, but how do we actually implement it? That's the next step that we should be reaching. We have, we have time for one last co comment or question. Hi. Um, one thing that came to my mind because I work here as an artist and I don't speak Finnish or Swedish, is uh, that, and I don't know, so I don't have access to what is the law most of the time and what are the rules. Because whenever I go to a page, it's either in Finnish or Swedish. So it's really hard for me to actually fight for my rights if I don't know what those are. So I think, like, talking about multilingualism also, like, and looking at how, for instance, in Finland, what are the languages, not the two, but perhaps four or five, then everything should be translated into them. Because, like, for instance, I have, like, uh, even from going to the doctor, I have to show my private information to someone who speaks Finnish to tell me what I have. <laughs> So, and the same with contracts, like, um, and Finnish and Swedish colleagues most of the time do not share how much money they're making. So when I ask what is the average or the proper, you know, pay, 
for me. They just like say, oh, we don't know, it varies. Like, so there's no, no way, and even with, through unions, like there was uh, some people who are Finnish speakers and Swedish speakers that tried through TEME, uh, this Union for Performing Artists. Uh, we wrote to them, I wrote in English, but uh, somehow they included me there to have like this plan that they then, the unions go to the employers and they ask that, oh yeah, you know, this should be taken into considerations regarding like discrimination. And even the unions page, like I'm not in a union, I've been asking, like all the unions pages are also in Finnish or Swedish and they have like a small thing that says, oh, if you want to contact us, write an email here or call us here and we'll respond. But it's a huge leap for someone to do. And when you are constantly fighting with, in, like, for your survival in language, like you go to the grocery store and you have to know my to is milk, or like you get yogurt instead, you know. Like, so you, you don't have time so to formulate like a whole email asking all the questions like in a language. And a lot of times also people think that every English speaking person here has like is native like they always complain about when we, we work in projects like in English with me this, this has happened that they always complain oh you know it's too easy for you for us it's not our first language well it's not my first language it's my working language here and there is always like this kind of so there are so many things and the other thing is resources like, could there be in the law that, yes, <laughs> we discriminate against mainstream and we give this amount of money to, like, other initiatives? Because whenever I'm invited in spaces, all the spaces that work with artists from foreign backgrounds and all the organizations, there are organizations, at least in the visual arts, like Catalusti and Globe Art Point, that are working with uh, people from other backgrounds and we get so little money that then when we have to invite someone we have to say you know what yes come we offer you this job but the, the fee is so small because so to kind of balance that you have to give like both people in Berlin they were talking about the resources like you have to give proper resources so yes when I invite someone from a foreign background, I can give them the 2,000 euros. Like that, and it has happened to me that also in, fin that I'm ranting, sorry, the last thing, that somehow I know, probably it's not illegal, that me and a Finnish colleague, we were invited to do the same work, and I was like offered 400 euros, and then I learned they were offered like 2,000 euros. So, and they offered this to me because they, I didn't know. So I think it's very, like, in lawmaking, I don't know if this is there, but somehow to be illegal to get a fee based on your background. <laughs> Thank you. This is a really big, uh, big issue that we try to, to tackle. I mean, you're talking about resources and the fact that uh, as an international artist or foreign background artist, it's more difficult to get to the resources and the finance, and then how you um, how you find the resources. It's it's a big big problem, and we are fighting <laughs> for that. And uh, also, Gap is very and Catalyst are very active to ask all the unions uh, to have pages in English to make this uh, equal and accessible. This is an ongoing discussion, and it's it's a big big. Uh, big issue that goes to the political decision, as you said. And this is what we, are, we need to make this lobbying. And then the authority, even though they acknowledge the, that there is a problem, that there is a lag, that there is a gap, there is still a resistance to really uh, provide uh, with the proper resources to fill up this gap. I look at the time, it's already five o'clock or even more. I've, we will stop here. This is like a opening a Pandora box. We can go on. <laughs> I hope we will go on. 
we have to go on, maybe not here in other situations, but uh, the question of, um, of diversity and inclusiveness is not just a favor that is done to the immigrant artists or the uh, international background artists, but it's a favor to the whole society to make it a more equal and open society. I would like just to remind you that there is a festival going on at the Svenska Theater organized by New Theater Helsinki. Tonight there is a performance, uh, wrong movements. Next week there will be a Turkish performance, Pizza, Pizza, Karagöz. Then uh, Libes Europa on Tuesday, State of Things. Uh, next week, Monday, Tuesday, State of Things and then Shamans, which is a multilingual performance uh, for kids. Thank you, thank you everybody for being here, for sharing this discussion. Thank you for the panelists, for the people present here and also online. Kitos. Thank you.